All righty, good morning. I'm Donovan Riches, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises, and this morning we're joined by Council Members Richie Torres, Council Member uh, Dan Gorodnik, and our newest member from Queens, uh, <laughs> Barry Gradenchik. Welcome, Barry. Thank you. Now, we are known for being punctual in this committee, so we want you to ensure that you are here on time, ready to go. You've s certainly started off the right way, uh, but welcome to the committee. We're going to have a lot of fun, and, and it's, one of, it's a great committee. You know, you really, we really work to make sure that uh, we do all we can to preserve and help communities and move communities forward. So welcome aboard and look forward to your guidance and wit in this committee, so, so glad to have you. Today we have four items on our calendar. We're going to start with a public hearing on land use item number 743, an application for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe in Councilmember Rodriguez District. This application would allow for a sidewalk cafe to be located at 4325 Broadway for the Altus Cafe Restaurant. I will now open the public hearing for land use item number 743. Have any applicants here? No? All righty. Seeing none, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on land use item number 743? Okay. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 743. Our next hearing will be on land use item number 744 and 745, the East Shore Special Coastal Risk District application for a zoning text amendment and zoning map amendment. This application would modify the zoning regulations applicable to portions of Oakwood Beach, Graham Beach, and Ocean Breeze in Staten Island. These zoning changes are intended to address high flood vulnerability in the area. The special zoning designation would limit future development to low density buildings and create a new discretionary action to ensure sufficient review of new developments potential development's potential effects on wetlands, neighborhood character, and public safety while allowing owners of existing homes to improve the safety of their buildings. In addition, the proposal would align commercial zoning with existing development patterns and uses. I will now open a public hearing on land use item number 744 and 745. And our first panel, I'll let you introduce yourself and just state your name for the record. Then you may begin. Good morning. I am Len Garcia Duran. I'm the director of the Staten Island Office for the Department of City Planning. With me are. Hello, good morning. Alina Farishta from the Staten Island City Planning Office. And good morning. My name is Trevor Johnson. I work in the Waterfront and Open Space Planning Division at the Department of City Planning. So I'll just provide a brief introduction before I hand this off to Alina, who will walk you through the details of the presentation itself. But just as a background, um, as you know, the Department of City Planning has actually been, has initiated. Uh, a number of neighborhood studies uh, throughout the entire city, uh, uh, those neighborhoods that were directly impacted by Sandy, and trying to understand exactly how zoning can assist them in recovering and rebuilding. Um, this particular item was a result of, next slide, of a public outreach on Staten Island on the East Shore specifically that included our council members, the borough president, um, a number of civic associations um, on the East Shore uh, Chamber of Commerce, and. Um, provided us an opportunity to actually really completely understand what the community's desires were for the future of the area and what some of the challenges were that zoning um, presented and how we'd actually um, address them through this effort. Earlier this year in April, we actually produced an East Shore report um, that actually identified a number of recommendations for this area, which included both rebuilding, um, just addressing the, the zoning to allow additional rebuilding in some of those areas where the community felt that um, it was appropriate along the commercial corridors. Um, we actually looked at uh, making recommendations for the residential neighborhoods to try and provide a better cottage envelope. But specifically on this particular um, effort this morning, we're looking at the state buyout areas specifically and those areas where the state has identified on Ocean Breeze, um, Midland Beach, and Oakwood Beach. Um, areas that the state has identified that they should remain as open space and has had a state buyout program in place. We wanted to assure that zoning matched those efforts. Um, just as a quick background before I hand this off, the East Shore is the hardest hit area and the largest area hit by Sandy in the entire five boroughs. It's an area that stretches four miles long across the shoreline and one mile deep. The water actually reached a mile deep in these areas. Um, many of these neighborhoods are actually a bit below uh, sea level. 
um, Father Capadano Boulevard is a high point in this area. Uh, many of these neighborhoods, specifically the state buyout areas, had faced substantial challenges um, even before Sandy. Many of these neighborhoods uh, faced challenges with wildfires every summer when the areas were dry and flooding every time the area was wet. Um, so the state buyout program was welcomed by many of these neighborhoods and it was an opportunity for many of them to state that they wanted to move out. Um, with this, I'm going to hand it to, oh, actually, I would also note that of all these recommendations that came out of the Easter, recomm uh, Easter report, the borough president and the council member asked me that we focus on the state bio area specifically as a first effort and bring this forward, but we anticipate coming forward in the future um, with additional recommendations for other areas outside of the state bio areas on the East Shore. Thank you. Um, so one more piece of context I'd like to provide before I walk through, you know, further characteristics of the buyout program. Um, the buyout areas, Graham Beach, Ocean Breeze, and Oakwood Beach are also largely coterminous with the DEC regulated freshwater wetlands and adjacent areas in addition to DEP's plan blue belt system. Um, and for those who may not be aware, DEP's plan blue belt system are planned and in progress of being constructed. Um, and their nature-based drainage infrastructure that make use of the natural topography to drain water upland to the bay. So key characteristics of the buyout program include that it was available to homeowners within these neighborhoods based on the basis of flood risk and the majority of homeowners desire to depart from these neighborhoods. Eligible homes were purchased at pre-storm value and homes and vacant land were eligible for the buyout program. However, commercial properties were not able to participate. Um, post acquisition use is restricted to open space um, in order to buffer from future storms within these neighborhoods. Um, since this program is voluntary, some homeowners and property owners will continue to remain in the buyout areas. Um, and per the data that we have from the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, uh, the participation in Graham Beach and Ocean Breeze, approximately 60% of the lots are now publicly owned or have bought out by the state, and in Oakwood Beach, the participation has been about 80%. Um, and as far as our information that we have is that, you know, no further offers are being made at the moment, um, and so this is kind of the these are the, the privately owned parcels we're aware of what's left and, and, and what's, what, what development rights still remain as of right in these areas. Um, the next few images just um, are going to be showing you the existing conditions in Oakwood Beach. In the Oakwood Beach buyout area, you can see that demolitions have started occurring and land is being returned to open space. And furthermore, in Graham Beach and Ocean Breeze buyout areas, although there was um, less participation, there are still large areas of wetlands and, and blue belts being constructed within the area. Um, so in summary, um, issues faced within the buyout areas moving forward are many, which include natural hazards, including flooding and wildfires, which are a risk to public safety. It's important to note that even after the construction of the Army Corps line of protection along the East Shore, the buyout areas will remain in the 1% annual chance floodplain. Um, furthermore, the function of planned DEP bluebelts and existing freshwater wetlands may be impaired by continued development and impervious coverage within these areas. And finally, as mentioned before, um, the state bio program is voluntary and would not reach 100%. And so residents and property owners will remain in these areas. The existing zoning and land use within the Oakwood Beach buyout area includes the R3X and R31 zoning districts. Um, this permits single and two family detached residences as well as detached and semi-detached residences. Um, although Oakwood Beach buyout area, there's a higher participation rate, you can see the concentration of privately owned vacant lots that still remain and have development rights at currently that would be as of right. Um, furthermore, in Graham Beach and Ocean, Beach, Ocean Breeze buyout areas, the districts include R32, R31, in addition to a C11 overlay. This would permit uh, multifamily residential units in addition to one and two family detached and semi-detached residences. And in addition, the commercial overlay would permit um, mixed use buildings as well. 
Um, so to walk through our proposal here, um, our proposal is seeking a zoning text amendment to create the East Shore subdistrict of the Special Coastal Risk District in order to align the local zoning regulations with the New York State's long-term vision for these buyout areas to remain as open space and to reduce and to reduce public safety by um, limiting future residential development in these highly vulnerable areas. In addition, a zoning map change is being pursued in the commercial area of Graham Beach to align commercial zoning with existing uses <coughs> and building character while providing relief from high parking requirements that may inhibit rebuilding after future floods. So to walk through specifically um, in summary of the East Shore Subdistrict, this would limit all new residential development to single family detached residences. Um, and in order to ensure sufficient review of new development, a CPC authorization is, would be created for all new development and horizontal enlargements. However, sandy damaged buildings could be continued to be um, repaired as of right, along with um, re minor retrofits and repairs as well. Um, in addition, community facilities with sleeping or overnight accommodations would be prohibited, and lower density growth management limitations on certain community facility uses would be applied consistently throughout the zoning districts. Um, in order to authorize the construction of one new development, the the, the proposal would need to demonstrate to the City Planning Commission that it um, minimizes potential impacts on na natural drainage, open spaces, and wetland areas, that the development would be located on an improved street serving other existing residences, and this is to reduce the amount of impervious coverage within the buyout areas, and finally, that the proposed development minimizes risk to public safety from natural hazards, including flooding and wildfires. Um, and furthermore, to authorize construction of more than one new development on a zoning lot, um, the, commission, the authorization would require that a minimum of 9,500 square feet of lot area would be required per building, excluding the delineated wetland area by DEC. Um, furthermore, the commission could permit bulk modifications, uh, modifications to bulk except FAR to allow developments to be cited in a manner that would achieve a superior site plan and that preserves the wetlands, minimizes the need for new infrastructure, and is consistent with the character of the surrounding area. Um, and finally, this proposal also includes a zoning map change to the existing C11 overlay in Graham Beach. These images here show the existing uses along Father Capadano Boulevard. Um, the remainder of the parcels beyond the frontage of Father Capadano Boulevard include um, single family residences in addition to lots that um, were purchased by the state through the buyout program. Um, the Resilient Neighborhoods Community Advisory Committee, the city and local elected representatives have agreed that maintaining the existing retail along um, Father Capadonna Boulevard here is appropriate, um, given that it's at a higher elevation than the properties located east of this area and the street is being supported by city services. Um, and furthermore, as a reminder, these existing commercial buildings were not able to participate in the buyout program. Um, so a rezoning is proposed for this commercial overlay. Um, we would be we're proposing to reduce the C11 overlay um, to the lots fronting Father Capadonna Boulevard where existing commercial uses um, currently exist. And we would be establishing a C1-3 overlay. Um, and the purpose of this is that you know the, it would permit the same range of uses, but it would reduce the required off-street parking to more closely align the type of local retail and parking that's currently provided. And it would make reconstruction after a future flood less difficult if these buildings were substantially damaged. Um, and finally, just want to go over that you know outreach that we've done with the community um, prior to the City Planning Commission certification. Um, in addition to the two to three years of planning process that we had with the Community Advisory Committee to come up with the East Shore Resilient Neighborhood Study, um, which included the recommendation for the state buyout areas, this proposal, um, we did consult and um, brief 
um, Borough President James Otto and Council Member Stephen Matteo. In addition, we did brief and consult with Community Boards 2 and 3 in Staten Island. And then finally, our, our Resilient Neighborhoods East Shore report was released in April of this year. Um, the East Shore buyout areas proposal was certified by the City Planning Commission on April 24th, 2017. Community Boards mm -hmm. 2 and 3 both held a public hearing and voted in approval of this application. The Staten Island Borough Board also adopted a resolution recommending approval of this recommendation. Borough President also issued a recommendation to approve the application. And finally, on August 9, 2017, the City Planning Commission voted to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your work on us. And I think in light of what we're seeing happening uh, in Texas and, and, and what could happen in Florida as we watch the weather patterns there, um, it's very important that we continue to look at tools that we can utilize to uh, make communities more resilient and sustainable, and this is obviously one way uh, of doing it, uh, looking at zoning. Um, is it safe to say that technically the whole purpose of all of this is to ensure to, that we're limiting development close to wetlands and areas that were affected by the storm? Is it safe to say this is the reason that we are taking this action. Yes, specifically within those areas that were already identified by the state as buyout areas so that our, our zoning is, is in sync with those recommendations about program. Right. So let's just go get into, so the state obviously has bought out a significant, you said around 60 percent of the homes in this area. Um, so I know that we're, we're going to limit development. Are we looking at any other strategies instead of just saying you should not rebuild here, obviously? This is in the event of another storm, catastrophic storm. We know these homes could be destroyed again, so it makes more sense to take the money and go elsewhere. Um, what tools, other tools is, are, is the city examining to ensure these communities are more resilient outside of just saying we're going to limit development in these areas. So are we looking at, I don't know, uh, green infrastructure projects in these areas, um, parks, any resilient measures to sort of align with the goals that city planning has put on the table? Those are all very good questions. I know while well, our toolkit is limited to zonings and rezonings, um, I know that we have worked closely in our outreach efforts with the Department of Parks and Recreation on their efforts uh, to uh, work with the Army Corps line of protection and any future redesigned master plan design of the beaches and the parks. Um, I know that the DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, is actually completing the Blue Belt projects on right, the east shore, yes. uh, which is very um, effective and supported by the community and the elected officials out on Staten Island. Um, I know that our east shore recommendation um, had other aspects besides the state buyout areas. I mean, there are retail commercial corridors in the area, Midland Avenue and Sand Lane, where the community would like to see those commercial corridors brought back, so to speak. Um, they do what does that mean, brought back? Um, they, a number of businesses are currently vacant post okay. Sandy, and um, we want to try and find methods to actually allow businesses to come back and build in a more resilient fashion. Um, there are challenges facing these neighborhoods because of the uh, flood levels, the flood zones in these areas. Um, so that's something we're going to continue working with the community, the Chamber of Commerce, the local development corporation that the state has assisted in funding um, on in Midland Avenue to try and bring back zoning recommendations to how we can actually encourage rebuilding in those areas. Um, our recommendations um, in the Easter report, uh, which had the support of the community, identified rezonings to allow additional density to mm -hmm. offset some of the expenses and challenges of rebuilding in those areas. Um, We've got other areas that we're looking at to um, actually as a, a citywide, um, what we're calling flood text two. Mm -hmm. The current flood text is actually an interim effort that was adopted several years ago. Uh, we're working closely with our waterfront division and going out to all five boroughs to understand how we can actually update the flood text citywide to reflect issues also. And you're going from a C1-1 to C13, correct? And, you're, and you believe that will help to um, uh, re-energize the commercial corridors in a way because you're reducing parking or? 
In that specific instance, in the state buyout areas, we're simply trying to make sure the zoning reflects the current okay. commercial that exists there today. Okay. I mean, we might probably find a different commercial zoning for the other areas where we actually want to encourage more building. Okay. And let me just get into, um, so let's, let's have the larger conversation right now. So how many of these neighborhood um, uh, coastal risk uh, rezonings uh, have taken place? So I know we did, I believe, Broad Channel. Um, what others are in the pipeline that we're not discussing today? So actually, I'm going to defer that to Trevor Johnson, who's our citywide um, waterfront division. I've got Staten Island, so I don't want to make any comments okay. by the other four boroughs. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the, the special coastal risk districts or sub-districts for Broad Channel and Hamilton Beach were before this committee and, yep. and the city council and were adopted um, earlier this summer. Um, at this time, we haven't identified other areas that would be um, subject to special coastal risk district-like treatments, um, but our plan moving forward is to continue to analyze uh, coastal hazards and risks and try to understand if there are other areas of the city that may, um, may benefit from this kind of zoning treatment. So... Many of these <coughs> proposals were proposed under the prior Bloomberg administration, correct? To, under the Bloomberg the, administration, the studies So most of the study areas that we're yeah. discussing now. So the Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative began under the previous administration, but much of the work and these proposals were formulated under the current administration. Right. All right. So how many areas did that administration, the prior administration, propose? So these were the only areas that they proposed to do these specific actions? Well, the tent, so the, if you return to slide, okay. um, let's see, slide four. slide four, these show the 10 neighborhoods that were studied through the Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative. Um, and these were comprehensive neighborhood resiliency planning studies um, from which a number of recommendations for zoning actions are, are, are either in the pipeline or will be forthcoming, including the citywide flood text that Len mentioned. Um, just so out of the 10 areas, the only, I think we've done, so now we're doing, uh, we've done Broad Channel, Rockaway Pe Beach, Rockaway Park, correct? That's correct. And now we're discussing the East Shore? Uh, we're, we're now discussing sorry, the East is, Shore um, of Staten Island. Yes. Sorry, Staten Island, I'm sorry. Yes. So, out of the 10, would it be safe to say that we have seven left? And where are we at with the other seven areas that... Yeah, so uh, it's not all of them will result in, in specific local zoning actions, but we are in the process of uh, conducting a significant amount of outreach to community boards and other stakeholders around the citywide flood text that will actually implement many of the recommendations from these local neighborhood studies. So. I guess to, to so when do we anticipate these studies will be completed? And, are, and and I know you spoke of looking at other specific areas. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, you know, I represent Edgemere and Rockaway. I'm interested in knowing what are the criterias that you, you're you guided by that would push you to do studies in these specific locations certainly the the amount of flood risk and the and the presence of zoning issues and so we've we've studied rockaway beach uh, and rockaway park and we've also it, in conjunction with hbd studied edgemere and and there may well be actions that come out of that planning study as well um so so th these will be forthcoming in the next year to two as we formulate how we will actually implement the recommendations of those planning studies. so can you speak to what are the criteria so I mean, majority of these areas were all hit by Hurricane Sandy, correct? Correct. So the, they all fit a certain criteria. I'm, what I'm interested in knowing is how did you prioritize these criteria, these specific areas? Primarily because of significant impacts from Hurricane Sandy and uh, particular zoning issues or building typologies that may have a difficult time retrofitting or, or being reconstructed in a way that is more resilient. Um, that's, that's largely because, as Department of City Planning, our primary tool is zoning, so we have the ability to influence that and, and make it easier for homeowners to, to make their buildings more resilient. Yeah. So I, I'm a, I, 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 we appreciate all the work that's been done on this, and I think I raised this in our meeting last week. My, my concern is that we're piecemealing a lot of these. So one by one, they come before the committee, mm -hmm. and we need to see more of a concerted effort to ensure that we are maximizing, especially in light, we know climate change is here. Um, we're going to see a, a, a very rampant and 
uh, increased hurricane season this year. And I feel like we're just piecemealing by coming to the committee one by one with these things. So when will we see more of a comprehensive plan? Is this a resource issue? Does city planning need more resources to really move more expeditiously to get a lot of these studies done? Um, when can we anticipate all of these areas? I would say those are all very good questions that I'll take back to our chair so she can actually respond directly. But I would also say there are a lot of issues that you're bringing up that are related to other agencies um, which right. come under the coordination of Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Um, which so let's get into like that. How is coordination amongst the agencies? I, I, are you I, speaking? I, I, I was going to suggest that we can, you know, I, I would also bring your message back to them to see if they can actually uh, respond directly. Next time they should come. That's a very good point. And I, I would also note that, you know, from the East Shore report that we did on Staten Island, just speaking to that one specifically, we work closely with ORR, HPD. Um, I, I can go through a number of acronyms from other agencies um, to make sure that they were all aware of what we could do. While our toolkit is zoning, we wanted to make sure that the community was aware of all the efforts going on from all the various agencies that are working on it. Um, and I'm actually going to introduce uh, Michael Morella, our water Good. Director. I was waiting for him to come out. <laughs> now, Thank you, Chairman. Now, and, and, and can you speak to what is the coordination beyond just with city agencies, DEC, uh, Army Corps? Sure. Is there any conversations going on with any of the There are, absolutely. And, and, federal. and specifically for yeah. the project before us today, the proposal before us today, okay. that was done in close coordination with DEC, in particular because of the amount of the freshwater wetlands that are f that are located within uh, within the geography of the proposed zoning actions. This is, uh, I would say, more broadly, the um, this work is also being coordinated with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and their proposed coastal protection project along the East Shore, and is in motivated in part because of that project. Though that project is going to be preventing storm surge from coming to the inland neighborhoods, with that new proposed dune system along the shoreline, there's going to be still a re what's called a residual flood risk in the upland communities. And that's where stormwater is likely going to be collecting in larger geographies um, due to the presence of that new, new berm. And so the tools that we are using today are intended to help address that type of risk as well. Going back to, though, I want to answer some of the previous questions you raised because I think they're very good and important questions. But I want to start with saying, yes, the 10 resilient neighborhood studies that were selected dating back to 20, 2013, really within days of the storm, we began thinking about this, so even to 2012. And these neighborhoods were selected for a few different criteria. One of which, as Len and Trevor were suggesting, is the amount of damage that was done by Hurricane Sandy, as well as the, uh, the vulnerability of the building uh, typology. But perhaps as important was that we knew that these were 10 study areas that could help inform how we would go about rezoning other areas of the city as well. So these, in many ways, were really neighborhoods that were representative of other neighborhoods. And so the types of buildings that we see in Gerritsen Beach in Queens, in Brooklyn rather, is similar to other types of, of neighborhoods that we see elsewhere within the waterfront. Similarly with Rockaway Park, Rockaway Beach, that's a building typology that could, that can give us, uh, help us identify the tools that are necessary to be able to apply those tools elsewhere. And that's where the citywide zoning text amendment comes in. And so we're starting outreach now to begin the conversations and would love additional support from the city council members to have more outreach events in your district sponsored by uh, the council members. If that's of interest to you, please do speak with us about that. Because we want to begin to speak with the public about how zoning can be a tool. But the citywide zoning text amendment is going to be an incredibly important moment because that is the comprehensive package that you're looking for insofar as that will address. Do we anticipate? We're working on the outreach now. Um, and so I don't want to give a date um, because I know I'm going to be wrong if we, but so it has to be year. done. So as they say, to say not this year, but well, certainly not this calendar but year. No. But okay. I th there's a reasonable um, likelihood that will be within the next 18 to 24 months. Part of the challenge is, is that we're not saying a definitive timeline yet because we want it to be informed by the outreach that we're doing now. We want to make certain that what we're discussing helps inform what that ultimate citywide zoning text amendment is and. As uh, this committee knows better than perhaps anyone else in the city, citywide zoning text amendments are pretty darn tough. 
Yes, we do. Uh, we have some experience in that. And uh, is there any emphasis on environmental justice communities, or are you looking at it from an environmental justice lens? Because when I when I look at these areas, these are not necessarily communities that. That's look right. Like I would also say, I mean, these are just the ten resilient neighborhood studies. Okay. But there's a lot more work that the agency is doing, and so we are in the process of just wrapping up a study on resilient industry right now, which is has clearly close ties to the issues faced by environmental justice communities. Um, th and that study is looking at both the zoning tools that can be used, as well as the programmatic tools that can be used to address concerns associated with uh, industrial uses mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. flood zone. What we're finding through the study, though, is that the zoning tools are really quite limited. The nature of the industrial areas in our city are those that don't face a lot of new development. Um, and if you don't have a lot of new development, zoning is not a really great tool to use. And so that's why we're really exploring. But I, but I will, aspects. just to counter that a little bit, though, at least the areas where we have that are industrial areas, uh, so they are parts of Manhattan, that we should be viewing and looking at tools to make sure that we... We, we, we absolutely yeah, are looking we, at a comprehensive plan and understand. those specific facilities, right. whether they're M1 to M3s, um, a fair point. But we want to ensure those contaminants in the event of a storm are not, as we see in Texas, as yes. we see in Houston. Our, right? our concern as well. Um, so I think that we should not run away from that as well. We should figure ways to creatively strengthen uh, the zoning and to allow up. perhaps, I don't know, I, I don't want to say what we right. should look at right now, but ways to strengthen those facilities. Right. I would note, though, many of the the environmental regulations associated with uh, the potential release of contaminants are referenced in zoning but are ultimately re enforced by other mechanisms right but we so we need to look at those things because Agreed. during hurricane 100%. sandy we and that is there was and that is in fact what issues we're around that thank you i'll go to uh, councilmember gorodnik for questions thank you very much mr chairman i just wanted to run through a few basics um the the program uh for eligible homes and the potential for buyback, that has not yet uh, launched, has it? The state bio program? Yeah, is that? It was launched by the state. I see. So this is, this is the, the, this is the add-on, this is the zoning portion of the state. The state's bio program, right. Okay, got it. So how many homes actually took advantage of the buyout program through the state? I think we've got numbers from the state. Yeah, so, so currently um, in Grand Beach and Ocean Breeze, um, there are 116 vacant privately owned tax lots and 98 non-vacant privately owned tax lots that remain, um, that did not participate in the state bio program. And in Oakwood Beach, um, there are 102 vacant remaining privately owned tax lots and 30 non-vacant privately owned and, tax lots. And how many... Those are the ones that didn't take advantage. Correct. How many are the ones? How many did take advantage? Um, uh, we we could follow up with those specific numbers, but both of these neighborhoods had around 500 private lots prior to the buyout program. So um, each one, you know, so that's 60 60 percent. Yeah, 60 percent so in the first and yeah. So in the neighborhood of you know between 200 to to 300 uh, sort of private properties by tax lot on a tax lot basis would have participated. Okay. Um, so now you have uh, a situation which we're going to be potentially changing the zoning to incentivize better uh, layouts, less ground coverage, more, sustain more sustainable developments in the area. What is the impact, if any, on the existing property owners um, of this zoning, the folks who did not take advantage of the buyout, buyback, um, the zoning rules are changing around them, so they will be what they will be. Uh, is there any impact or requirement or obligation on them as a result? Uh, no, there are no additional um, obligations on them. They're, they're, they can continue to remain, and they can continue to make minor repairs to their homes to become resilient as well. But it, is there – nothing triggers an additional obligation to uh, add 
uh, open space, if they're doing any renovations or anything like that. Uh, they, they have the same, they're essentially grandfathered in the old zoning text. Is that correct? Correct, unless, you know, if they, it depends on the type of, like, maybe alteration that, that they would be pursuing. Um, if it's a horizontal enlargement, that would be, depending on the square footage, that would be, con would require this TPC authorization. So if they choose to not make any changes, or um, there are no further zoning requirements. And if they were to demolish and rebuild, then they would be covered by the zoning, is that right, the new zoning? Correct, they would, they would have to follow the new rules. And the... The lots that, that took advantage, whatever the precise number is, of the state buyback program, those lots will be what now? What, what's happening with them? They, they will just remain as open space. So the state has begun demolitions. So um, they're in process. They're not totally completed yet, but they will just remain as open space. And I think, um, and perhaps others can speak to it, but there are other programs that the state's been looking into to see, you know, um, in terms of how to take care of these lots um, after this program is complete. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to Chair Greenfield. And just on that, I, you just on that, I know in Edgemere, um, we were discussing doing community garden type mm -hmm. things. Uh, is there any thought? Has the community made any reference to? utilizing these sites because one of the worst things mm -hmm. that can happen is they become blight and mm -hmm. you know what is the maintenance going to look like <laughs> uh, at the end of the day so can you speak to sort of where we're headed with that uh, others can chime in as well but because uh, I don't want a case where like what we have in Edgemere now mm -hmm. and I'm not blaming this administration where we have a hundred empty lots <laughs> sure. that are sitting there sort of there you know so I'm interested in hearing sort of what are some of the strategies and that, that's certainly a place. concern of the city of the state, too. And the, those conversations are ongoing, again, through the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency with the state. Um, I would note that there is one program, as an example, called Lot Next Door, which would allow homeowners to uh, essentially have a l very low-cost lease on the, on the property next door, which would be deed-restricted as open space, but they could use it as a, a, essentially a yard and, and can do other sorts of um, low-impact activities on it. And what does the outreach look like on that? Uh, I think it's ongoing. The state uh, is administering that outreach. Okay. But they've they've gone out. We've we've been at civic group meetings on the okay. shore where they presented on this and tried to seek um, tried to seek participation in the program. Okay, great. I'll go to Chair Greenfield. Thank you for that. Thanks very much. Actually, I just want to follow up a question on Chair Richards. So, just curiosity. State purchases a home. There's a um, flooded out house on that property. What are you doing with that property? Just status quo or are you knocking it down? When you say like lot next door, that implies that there's an actual lot next door. What if there is a home that's in disrepair next door? So the state is actually acquiring those sites and demolishing the homes. Again, the goal, end goal is to have it remain in open space. Okay. Um, it will remain, at the moment, these are remaining in state jurisdiction. Um, so they are demolishing the homes. Yes, they are demolishing. As far as you know, all these homes that have been purchased have been demolished. Um, there are rubble's been removed. There, there it's been are clear space. Most of them have been. There are still that have not been, just because they okay. are uh, semis. So they're attached to perhaps a, a, an adjacent home that's still occupied. Got it. So the state's working through those issues still. Okay, good. When is this program, state program, closing? So the state is no longer making any new offers, except in the in the case of hardship. Um, exactly how hardship is going to be defined by the state is yet to be determined. What do you mean by a new offer? So, oh, if I so own, if I currently own a home, let's say I, I live there or I left the home, yes. uh, can I now still sell it to the state or no? Uh, n unless you have some sort of hardship, no. I can't. No. So th the state has, over the past now four plus years, yeah. has made offers to every homeowner that they can find, which is the best. I understand. I mean, I guess my question is, are they? I mean, we're kind of changing the circumstances. Essentially, we're devaluing much of this property. Let's be blunt, right? That's essentially what we're doing over here by changing the zoning. I mean, to be clear, according to your own slide sheet, to authorize construction of one new development, you need to have CPC authorization. So effectively, what you're doing is you're changing the zoning so you can't even build a home on a property as of right anymore. Is that correct? Well, you would still be able to build a home, though you would have to seek authorization. As of right is what I said, sir. Uh, yes. Is that correct? You are correct, Mr. Thank yeah. you. So the point that I'm making is that effectively we've devalued these properties. Is there an opportunity to go back? I mean, I guess my concern is that, you know, some people hold on to this hope and dream. One day I'm able to build my house. I'm going to rebuild my house. Well, sorry, folks, it's not going to happen. 
And so it seems like a slight change of circumstances where I may have thought that I could come back and build my house, and now essentially we're doing a zoning action that will essentially guarantee that you can never come back or it'll be very difficult for you to come back and build your house. Is there a way to sort of reopen that possibility or let them know or maybe – do you see what I'm saying? Like if I, if I own a home and I think, hey, you know, I'm, I have this romantic notion of living by the water and one day I'm going to go and rebuild my home – or I'm going to rebuild a lot, or the washed-out home, and now essentially the zoning is going to make it difficult, if not impossible, for me to do so, that might be a renewed opportunity to go back and say, okay, maybe you want to sell now. Quite frankly, uh, they'd be selling, uh, looking down the, the barrel of the zoning gun, but still it would allow them an opportunity to potentially, potentially get out. So is that an opportunity, or is it kind of they're, at this point they're just screwed? <coughs> I think that's an ongoing question that even the borough president has. I know the borough president has a monthly um, standing task force meeting that includes state and federal government and city in attendance. And um, I know the electeds have been uh, suggesting that there should be some program that would allow um, ongoing buyouts. Um, that's something that I think um, others are still discussing how that could actually occur. I know that the um, city has a, um, a buyout program outside of the state areas that where you can actually – um, sell for redevelopment, um, but these specific areas, um, the state buyout areas, are the most significantly challenged areas to rebuild in. So that, and that was one of the reasons why the state identified them to, for the buyout program, and, and there are communities where the neighbors have been, over the years, have been trying to find solutions to the wildfires and the flooding, and when Sandy occurred, a um, majority of them signed petitions saying they wanted to simply get out. Well, as this area of the East Shore, like I said, is four miles long and one mile deep. There are many other communities that want to see rebuilding, and we want to make sure that zoning allows that to occur easily and readily in more resilient fashion. These three state buyout areas that we're focusing on today are those areas where we're trying to ensure that you know, the long-term future is open. No, I understand that. I'm just a little <laughs> bit uncomfortable because you just said yourself it's something that, that the borough president is discussing, which I trust you on that. I'm, I'm still a little bit uncomfortable with the idea that Essentially, there were folks that had the ability to sell their homes. They no longer have the ability to sell their homes, and now we're effectively downzoning their properties so that they cannot build as a right anymore. But they don't have any other uh, recourse. So, so I think, and, 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 I, and I'm certain, and I'm, I'm certain that the way the reason you structured it and the reason that you keep focusing on the CPC authorization is because technically. Right, from a legal perspective, it's not actually a taking, so they don't have the ability to go to uh, court and try to get compensated for that, which is fine, which is certainly the work that you should be doing at, at the city Department of City Planning, making sure that you're not engaging in an accidental takings. But at the same time, right, it does put some of these homeowners at a disadvantage, especially the ones that thought that they might be able to rebuild. Effectively, now they're not going to be able to rebuild. And I'm not disagreeing with that. So I guess I come to the next question, like, why not consider some sort of uh, – eminent domain or some other possibility, if that's really what you want to get at over here, which is pre prevent people from from uh, moving back, certainly the homes that are not occupied, right? the homes that are occupied, I don't, I don't want to see people yelling and screaming and getting dragged out of their homes, but the home is not occupied, why not uh, consider eminent domain and just say, okay, we're taking over the property, and we'll pay you the value and have a nice day? So I think it's a couple of things. One is that Sandy damage is actually in a different category. Sandy damage homes are, are, in fact, in a different category procedurally under this proposal. So if your home was hand, if your home was damaged by Sandy, it goes through a different procedure. The authorization are when you're making significant changes to your home, like a horizontal uh, enlargement or building new. So those, I think that's a very different category. And yes, there would be a CPC authorization, though I do not think even administratively it's going to be that big of a hurdle that it would present a signif significant uh, diminution of value. Um, the, yes, there are in fact in regulations that are going to be put in place here. Though I'd argue though, mm -hmm. the, perhaps the most important regulation that we're putting in place related to the authorization is related to the wetlands the existing wetlands. And it's more that, that this zoning is now in line with the existing DEC regulations than a new burden in place. Because under the path, if we were not to change zoning, an applicant who has wetlands on their site would still have to go through D the DEC regulations. It's just a question of how our zoning meshes with that, with 
uh, with the DEC regulations, and we think this authorization does a far better job of doing just that. I understand exactly what you're doing. I just wish, and I'm stressing the point, that I really wish there was a final opportunity for these homeowners to, to get out, because I think at this point, uh, effectively what we're doing, uh, intentionally or unintentionally, I would argue it's unintentional, because intentionally you're just trying to prevent uh, development in areas that probably shouldn't be developed, but unintentionally we're devaluing the, the, the values of these properties and these homes, and I think many folks who aren't as sophisticated as you and I may simply not be aware of that. And I really wish there was a final opportunity to let them know, folks, this is happening. There's a window. Get out while you can, because, you know, your property that was worth 300000 is probably going to be worth 100000 now, and so, or may be, quite frankly, close to worthless uh, soon. And so, I, it just it seems unfortunate to me and a little frustrating perhaps that that possibly doesn't exist. And I understand that it's a state program, so I'm not pointing figures. I'm just highlighting an issue that I'm concerned about and encouraging you to try to see if it's something that you can potentially work on, considering that this will have impact on dozens of property owners. And we will be continuing to work on it. Who aren't as sophisticated as the folks in this room. Thank you very much. I would also note that I think the state and the city made efforts to actually pretty much knock on everyone's door multiple times in these state ballot areas to let them know the programs were available at that point. Oh, I understand, and but they're not aware. My point that I'm making is not that. I'm sure they all knocked on their doors and found them, but they're not aware what's happening right now. And I don't think there's an understanding. And even if they were suddenly to become aware, they don't have the opportunity to buy out right now. That's my concern. I'm not saying it was in the past, but I'm referring to the fact that there are people, and it's natural. You're saying, hey, I'm going to rebuild. One day I'll build, rebuild, whatever it is. And then at this point, essentially, it's too late. I'm not convinced that folks are aware of that. And even if they are aware, it seems like there's no opportunity for them to now take advantage of a program that you're right. They should have taken advantage of, but we're all human. And I would say regarding this particular um, effort, I know that we did a lot of outreach in advance with the Civic Association leaders in Midland Beach, in uh, Cedar Grove, in Oakwood Beach. Um, these were their rec these are the result of their recommendations also. And no, I, I, once again, I'm, I'm, I want to be clear. I'm not pointing to anything faulty in your process. Okay. I'm simply raising an issue of the interaction between the city and the state and the fact that the state's program is closed, the city's making a change. As you know, civic leaders are not homeowners. Many times civic leaders do things the homeowners don't know about it. That's my only concern. I'm flagging it so that if there's some way that you folks could do something about it, I think it would be helpful. That's Point all. Taken. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Any members of the public uh, here who wish to testify on this issue? All right. We're going to hold off for one second. All righty. Any other members of the public, once again, who wish to testify on this issue? I right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use items number 744 and 745. And we are now going to hold a vote on these two applications and two other applications that we laid over from our last meeting. And I'll just uh, state on the record, um, Councilmember Matteo does support uh, this rezoning effort. Uh, but we also would like to see in writing from city planning uh, many of the things we've raised today questions around what does the rest of the coastal community studies look like um, and other questions my colleagues raised so if that can be sent to us in writing uh, before we vote this out in the council that would be uh, helpful all right we'll be voting now to approve land use items number 743 743 Altus Cafe with the modifications that were recommended by the community board to limit the size of the cafe to, cafe to no more than 10 tables and 20 chairs and limit the hours of operation between 12 p.m. to wait am I right 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays am I right? I thought so, <laughs> 12 to 12 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. We'll also be voting uh, to approve land use item number 744 and 745, the East Shore Special Coastal Risk District. Councilmember Matteo once again has submitted a statement in support of approval, and we'll still await uh, uh, our uh, uh, answers in, in writing from city planning as well.
Yes. All right. And we were going to wait for uh, Council Member Steve Levin, but we will be also voting to approve land use items number 730 and 731, the 50 Nevin Street rezoning. This application would allow for development of a 128-unit supportive and affordable housing development located in his district, and he supports this approval. Lastly, we will be voting to approve land use items number 732, the 40 Wooster Street special permit application. Councilmember Chen supports approval of this application to allow retail use on the ground floor and cellar and residential use on the second through sixth floor of an existing building in Soho as well. All righty, before we go to a vote, do any of the subcommittee members have any questions or statements on these applications? All righty, seeing none, I will now uh, call on a vote to approve land use item number 743, 744, 745, 730, 731, and 732. Council, please call the roll. Sorry, correction. It should be approved with modifications. Oh, I'm sorry, and approved with modifications on land use items number 743, 744. Sorry, modifications, the rest are approved. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Vote with modifications, and the rest are approved. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're voting to modify 743. Okay, okay. All right, let me reread that. Okay, I will now call a vote to approve land use item number 743 with modifications. And then we'll vote to approve land use items number 744, 745, 730, 731, and 732. Council, please call the roll. Chair Richards. I vote aye on all. Councilmember Grodnick. Aye. Councilmember Torres. I vote aye. And Councilmember Grodenchik. Aye on all. A vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. Uh, land use items 744, 745, 730, 731, and 732 are approved. And land use item 743 is approved with modifications. And all items are referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. And uh, this meeting is now adjourned.